Jetty of Historian Explaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. These lectures are on SoundCloud, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and other platforms. And if you can help to keep them coming, please go to my Patreon page. The link is in the description. And this is The Origins of the First World War, Part 12, War Strategy and Planning. And this will be brought to you by the letter S. So in the previous lecture, Part 11, on the 19th century revolution in warfare, I mainly discussed the massive changes in the tactics of war, the way that weapons worked and how they were used on the battlefield and how that changed the dynamics of war. And now I'm going to talk about strategy, meaning the broader visions and plans of when and where to fight a war, where to engage the enemy in order to achieve objectives and win the conflict. And I'm going to discuss also how war strategy became the subject of dramatic controversy, not only within war academies and general staffs, but also out in public. And finally, we'll look at the specific plans that particular nations made in anticipation of the next war. But I'm going to start off first with a recorded sound made in London in the year 1890. So that recording is of a bugle call played by Martin Landfried, the bandmaster of the Sussex Volunteer Artillery in England. And Landfried at this time was somewhat notorious because he had been one of the trumpeters attached to the British Cavalry's Light Brigade 26 years earlier in the Battle of Balaclava, an engagement of the Crimean War. And he claimed to have actually sounded the charge for the Light Brigade, to begin their ride through a narrow valley to attack a Russian artillery battery head-on on October 25, 1854, a disastrous, ill-conceived assault resulting in hundreds of casualties, which nonetheless became famous and even celebrated, quickly entering into British national mythology as the so-called Charge of the Light Brigade. At that time, during the Crimean War, British and French forces were besieging the Russian port of Sebastopol on the Crimean Peninsula, and the besiegers had landed troops and taken positions in the countryside around Sebastopol, but the Russians defended the town, deploying various units including cavalry and riflemen, and placing artillery on tops of high hills. On October 25th, fighting broke out for control of hilltops around a small valley north of the city, and the Russians captured a series of small British redoubts along the hilltops on one side of this small valley, and the Russians then began carrying away some of the cannons that they had captured in these redoubts and leaving behind units of riflemen. So at this point, the Russians now controlled three sides of the valley, They had riflemen stationed along the two long sides of the valley, along the north and south, and at the far eastern end, they had placed a line of artillery units with about 30 to 40 cannon, and behind them, some cavalry. So the British now held only one end of the valley at the far west, and British units, including cavalry, were there prepared for a possible attack. And they included among them the so-called heavy brigade of cavalry, which was designed for frontal assaults, and included fighters with heavy swords and iron armor, mounted on large, strong horses called chargers, also with armor. And it also included the light brigade, and this comprised fighters with smaller weapons, mainly light sabers and lances, mounted on light, unarmored, fast-moving horses, And this unit was designed more for skirmishing and for pursuing enemies in retreat, especially those who were trying to carry away heavy weapons like cannons. So the British Supreme Commanding Officer in the battle was General Lord Raglan. And Raglan could see that the Russians had taken these small redoubts along one side of the valley and were carrying away some British cannon that they had captured. And so he dispatched a written command to the units at the west end of the valley. And the command read thusly, quote, 
Lord Raglan wishes the cavalry to advance rapidly to the front, follow the enemy, and try to prevent the enemy carrying away the guns. Troop horse artillery may accompany. French cavalry is on your left. Immediate. End quote. So Lord Raglan handed off this written command to a certain Captain Nolan, who rode off and carried the order to Lord Lucan, the commander of British cavalry. And Lord Lucan reportedly was rather confused. From his point of view, he did not see the cannons being wheeled away. He only saw the Russian riflemen and artillery surrounding the valley. And he asked Nolan, what cannon does the general mean? Nolan reportedly swept his arm in the general direction of the valley and said, there, my lord, is your enemy, there are your guns. Lord Lucan apparently said, all right, and turned to the commander of the light brigade unit named Lord Cardigan, who happened to be his brother-in-law and whom he personally disliked. And he commanded Lord Cardigan to take the light brigade and go charge the artillery emplacement at the opposite end of the valley. And Lord Cardigan complied. He mustered up the light brigade, which at this point comprised 607 men on horseback, and led the charge into the valley. While they proceeded, they were fired upon by riflemen from both the left and the right, and increasingly were bombarded with cannonballs and shells from the artillery battery straight ahead of them. Some men, and even more horses, were hit and wounded, and several killed. Captain Nolan suddenly rode out galloping in front of the unit, but was promptly hit by an exploding shell and died. Lord Cardigan later said that he thought that Nolan was trying to usurp command of the unit, but after the battle, it seemed more likely that Nolan had realized his error and was trying to stop the charge. After more than a mile and after taking severe losses, the Light Brigade finally charged up the hill and attacked the Russian artillery unit directly. Some men were immediately blown apart by cannon fire at close range. They attacked the artillerymen and did force some to flee and abandon their guns. Some cavalrymen then proceeded onwards past the cannons and engaged the Russian cavalry in close, bloody fighting. They soon found that they were outnumbered and were starting to be surrounded, and so they retreated. They rushed back through the valley and began to reconnoiter and regroup behind the British lines. And once there, they found that out of their number, 156 had been killed, 122 wounded, and 131 dismounted and mostly taken prisoner since horses, being larger than human beings, were even easier targets for rifles and cannons, and apparently 335, or more than half, of the unit's horses had been killed or mortally wounded. So all in all, out of the 607 men who set out on the charge, only 198 came back, and it achieved basically nothing. So the reaction to this disaster was split and ambivalent from the very beginning. The Russians reportedly believed that the British cavalrymen must have been drunk. A French officer looking on from another hill reportedly remarked, quote, C'est magnifique, mais ce n'est pas la guerre. C'est de la folie. It is magnificent, but it is not war. It is madness. The following month, in November 1854, the incident was reported in London newspapers, and it led to some degree of scandal with the officers Lord Raglan, Lord Lucan, and Lord Cardigan all blaming the miscommunication on one another. But also at the same time, there was an explosion of celebration of the heroism and sacrifice of the horsemen of the Light Brigade. And it soon became the main iconic event of the Crimean War in British eyes. Alfred Lord Tennyson, the new poet laureate of Great Britain, wrote a poem about the charge very soon after reading about it in the newspapers. And the poem is in six sections, and I will read just the first three, so the, more or less the first half of the poem, to give you a sense of its thrust. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward, all in the valley of death rode the six hundred. Forward the light brigade, charge for the guns, he said, into the valley of death rode the six hundred. Forward the light brigade, was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew, someone had blundered. Theirs not to make reply, theirs not to reason why, theirs but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the six hundred. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon in front of them volleyed and thundered. Stormed out with shot and shell, boldly they rode and well, into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell, 
wrote the 600. So while one could say this poem is a kind of elegy, as poets often customarily wrote, celebrating the glorious dead in war, it is not exactly mournful. You can hear it has the electrifying fast pace of a cavalry charge. And there's also, you could see, a hint of black irony in the poem when the speaker remarks that these riders didn't know that the orders they were following were a mistake, a blunder. And the irony is that the more ill-conceived and futile the commander's orders were, the more admirable the fighter's sense of duty and sacrifice in carrying them out anyway. So the Crimean War in which this disastrous charge took place was the first war between major powers in Europe in 40 years since Napoleon had been defeated at Waterloo. And it was the first one to test the supposed lessons of the Napoleonic Wars and whether they would still hold up with the new weaponry that was coming to the battlefield in the Industrial Age. And the strange irony of the reaction to the charge of the late brigade in Britain prefigures the ambivalence and confusion of how to understand war in the 19th century as the new weapons made war more bloody and destructive. And this would only increase as the century went on and as the old tactics, like cavalry charges, lost their efficacy. So by 1870, 16 years after this incident, German and French forces clashed in the massive Battle of Sedan. And the French commander, General Marguerite, personally led three head-on cavalry charges directly to the German enemies. And the courage and boldness of these charges amazed even King Wilhelm of Prussia, who was looking on and who reportedly remarked in French, Oh, ces braves gens, oh, these brave people. But it was completely futile, even more than the light brigade charge at Balaclava, which at least did manage to reach the enemy and inflict some casualties. In the Battle of Sedan, Marguerite ultimately was killed, and the Emperor Napoleon III himself was captured and his government fell. So the mythologization of the Light Brigade reflects an intense and rising ambivalence about war in the 19th century, with the rapid strengthening of the deadly power of artillery, the greater power, range, and precision of the weapons, and as attacks, especially frontal attacks like cavalry charges, became impossible without huge losses, or just completely impossible full stop. So there was a mounting defender's advantage, which in effect meant that more men, more resources, more lives had to be sacrificed for relatively small gains on the battlefield. And there were torn reactions to this change between, on the one hand, recoiling away from the very idea of war as it became increasingly horrific, bloody, and futile, and secondly, celebrating the incredible courage of the fighting men and doubling down on the idea that speed, boldness, and decisiveness, summed up with the French word morale, could overcome the defender's advantage and deliver swift victories, and hence, in this way, could actually spare the world the miseries of a long war. So in the view of some, the solution to this increasing destructiveness of war was to meet escalating firepower with escalating daring and fortitude. And this reaction did not come out of nowhere. It is reflected even as early as the writings of Clausewitz, published in 1831, which served as the main distillation of the lessons of the Napoleonic War. Clausewitz had tried to combine the 18th century practices of planning and discipline with the mass mobilization and nationalistic frenzy of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. And even Clausewitz showed a kind of split reaction to the intensification of war in his time in the early 19th century. On the one hand, admiration for courage in the face of fire, but also horror at the futility and destruction of battles that achieved little actual result. And this intensification, even though it is, you can see it reflected even as early as Clausewitz's work, it became a pressing matter, especially after 1870. Now that artillery even further increased its firepower and rapidity by several fold beyond even what it had been in the Crimean War. And also now that war had begun to strike civilians as well. So the basic dilemma, you could say, was could the Napoleonic idea of war 
still work in the face of new, powerful, destructive weapons and massively increased defenders' advantages? And there was a range of different answers to this question from different parties and viewpoints. So in the last quarter of the 19th century, there was a significant and growing peace movement with increasingly widespread public support. Its leaders tended to advocate for arbitration to settle disputes between powers instead of war. And sometimes states did do this effectively, and it increased in the later 19th century. There were about 300 formally held international arbitrations in Europe between 1815 and 1914, and over half of them took place after 1890. This movement was led mainly by civilians and in large part by women, such as the Austrian novelist Bertha von Suttner, and also by labor union and socialist leaders. The Nobel Peace Prize, first awarded in 1901, served in large part to elevate these peace organizers in this pan-European peace movement. And pacifism and anti-militarism did gradually gain footholds in parliaments and governments, especially after 1900. The pro-Boer faction, which took over the Liberal Party in Britain around 1900 and then came to power in government after 1906, is just one example. Also, the more left-wing Labour Party. And there were other left-wing parties, such as the Socialist Party in France and the Social Democratic Party in Germany, that gained some share of power in government beginning around 1910. And the opposition to war also rose among centrist Christian Democratic parties. And all in all, this movement seemed to offer some political pressure against beginning wars and also in favor of making peace once wars had begun. And one of the tangible achievements of this peace movement was the convening of two arms control conferences at The Hague in the Netherlands. The first one was held in 1899, and 26 countries sent delegates to The Hague to try to work out agreements on limiting the stockpiling of weapons or on banning certain types of weapons that were too destructive or too dangerous to civilians. And the conference failed to come to any agreement about limiting or reducing weapons quantitatively, but it did achieve some modest results in terms of qualitative limits on types of weapons and it passed resolutions banning asphyxiating gases, the dum-dum or expanding bullet, and the dropping of explosives from balloons. And this last one may seem almost comical in how narrow and specific it was, but in fact you could see it as prescient. It actually showed some awareness of the looming new threat of war from the air, especially the new danger to civilians of airborne warfare. The conference also made initial plans to set up a permanent court of arbitration to settle international disputes. In 1907, a second conference was held also at The Hague, and this one worked out rules setting clearer boundaries between civilians and combatants, such as working out the status and rules of engagement for neutral states and for enemy merchant ships. And it also recommended that another conference be held in eight years, and so the delegates, it seemed, envisioned a new sort of perennial practice of conferences every eight years to set agreements and limits on war. You could say it was reminiscent in this way of the peace and truce of God movement in the late 10th and early 11th centuries, which set limits on whom combatants could attack and when. So all in all, the actual tangible results of these conferences were pretty small, but they had at least set a new precedent and they indirectly served as a venue to spread a new set of ideas, of more radical and comprehensive ideas, which would later come to be seen as prophetic. So specifically, one Russian attendee of the conference in 1899 was a Russian subject and sometime government official named Jan Bloch, who was seen handing out copies of his new book. So who was Bloch? He was a Russian businessman, industrialist, and government official, who had been born and raised in Poland, born to a Jewish family, although he had converted to Protestantism, attended university, and gone into business. And he had made a massive fortune, mainly in banking and railroads. He was one of the major wealthy tycoons of Russia. And at this time, industries like the rails were heavily connected to the state and state-subsidized. So, not surprisingly, he was brought into government service as well. 
In 1877, the Russian general staff tapped him to oversee the rail network for mobilization in the Russo-Turkish War. And serving in that role, he saw the great importance of logistics and also the great difficulty and expense of prosecuting a modern war, especially against a well-entrenched defender like the Ottomans in Bulgaria. So he began researching more about war, including the changes in, in weaponry and tactics that were happening almost every day. In the 1880s, he was somewhat distracted during the time of Russian pogroms against the Jews, and he became involved in advocating for the safety and well-beings of Jews in the empire, also in supporting the early Zionist movement. But he then soon returned to writing about warfare. And in 1898, he completed a massive six-volume treatise examining modern war and arguing that its costs would soon be so massive and the whole endeavor so futile and destructive that no state could possibly sustain a war for long without collapsing from within. And he helped actually to inspire Nicholas II to call for the disarmament conference in The Hague in the following year in 1899. And Bloch had the last concluding volume of his treatise translated into English under the title Is War Now Impossible? and printed just in time to hand it out to delegates and reporters at the conference. And the book, it seems, caused some stir. And it basically argued in somewhat finer detail. It argued that with the new powerful artillery and smokeless gunpowder, armies could no longer move across open terrain without being decimated. Old tactics like bayonet and cavalry charges were now useless and obsolete, and the enormous cost of attack would only grow as technology continued to advance. Thus, decisive battles and swift victories were now a thing of the past. Any great power war would inevitably collapse into trench warfare with a long stationary front, and the combatant states would mobilize massive million-man armies which would then be frozen into a stalemate or into a long, bloody war of attrition. The real limiting factors, therefore, of war would be the nation's industrial output and their ability to keep producing and keep pace with the destruction on the war front. All of society's resources would be requisitioned and funneled into this destructive stalemate war, and ordinary commerce and industry would cease. Home fronts thus would sink into a state of deprivation, famine, disease, and ultimately total social collapse and the overthrow of the state in revolution from below. So how were Bloch's arguments received? Well, it is sometimes said that he was totally ignored, and he's sometimes cast as a Cassandra figure. But this is not really accurate. In fact, he did draw a great deal of attention among the press and the public, and also to some degree among military staffs and academies as well, most of all in Great Britain. And the reaction to his work was mostly, but not entirely, negative. For example, he was invited to speak at the United Services Institute, which was attended by many members of the general staff and high-ranking military officers, and he presented his ideas there in 1901. Much of the audience in response was infuriated, and one officer stood up and called his work, quote, namby-pamby so-called humanitarianism. General Ian Hamilton, who was the commander at that time in the field in the Boer War, read his work and called it trash. But also, some others took his arguments more seriously, both in Britain and also in Russia, although they disagreed with some of his predictions and prognostications. And some of them made more specific criticisms and objections to certain flaws in his arguments. For example, Bloch looked at the rapid increase in the power of rifles over the course of the 19th century, and he extrapolated forward into the future, saying that they would continue to increase their firepower and range indefinitely. But as some critics objected, there was actually a natural limit to the power of a handheld gun like a rifle. After some point, the kickpack is so great for a person to absorb that it has to be somehow secured onto the ground on a stand or a platform or wheels, and hence it eventually just becomes a cannon. So there was a natural limit to the power of light artillery that by 1900 had really already been reached. And so based on some of these mistaken suppositions, some of Bloch's critics argued, whether rightly or wrongly, that his conclusions were overstated 
and in many cases that he had wrongly discounted the continuing ability of a good attack to overcome a defender's advantage. Now, perhaps these criticisms were partly wishful thinking. It's hard to say. Hindsight is twenty twenty. You know, it's easy to take Bloch's overall argument and then look at the events of the Great War and the series of revolutions that destroyed the Russian Empire, Wilhelmine Germany, Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and say that he was entirely prophetic. But at the time, reaction was mixed. And the aspect of his argument that the largest number of military officers and planners actually embraced and recognized the validity of was the final conclusion about social instability and the danger of revolution. Now, perhaps this is partly because at this time in the 1890s and the early 1900s, there was already a great deal of fear around of social unrest and revolution. It was a time of rising anarchism and militant nationalism, a time of assassinations and sabotage. And so Bloch's prophecy perhaps struck a nerve for these reasons. But for whatever reason, Bloch got the greatest audience of all in Britain in terms of the different countries. And in Britain, there was a combination of a traditional resistance to involvement in European wars and attachment to their tradition of splendid isolation. And also, after about 1910, there was increasing fear of militancy and social upheaval within British society, as I spoke about in my lecture on Britain, the upheavals from the militant labor movement, the Irish nationalist movement, and women's suffrage, each of which alone seemed to presage a possible revolution, let alone all happening in tandem. And it happens that another important anti-war propagandist who picked up on and extended certain aspects of Bloch's arguments in a sort of digested form for a British audience was named Norman Angel. And Angel was a young British journalist and editor who became disillusioned in his early life with Europe, went abroad to America and worked as a cowboy and a gold prospector, and then came back and once again worked for newspapers in Paris. And in 1909, partly inspired by Bloch, he wrote an incendiary short pamphlet called Europe's Optical Illusion, which proved to be a great hit, and in 1910 it was expanded into a book under the title The Great Illusion. And the book argues that national economies across Europe and much of the world were at that time totally interdependent, interconnected by trade, investment, and credit such that if one major power went to war with another, they would both ruin each other's economies simply by cutting off trade and repudiating debts. And even if one side won the conflict, they could not seize the other's wealth without destroying the productivity of their own investments. Now, I cannot say on my part how valid this argument is, and I'm not sure if I fully understand it or the mechanisms of it, and furthermore, I would note the conclusion seems quite ambiguous. Is this a book of advice or of prediction? If economic gain by war is now impossible, as Angel argues, does that mean that it is foolish and inadvisable for states to start a war? Or does it mean that no states are going to go to war any longer, that basically the age of war is over, and hence Britain, by implication, need not prepare for war? need not waste money and resources on a war that will never happen. But this version would assume that states only go to war for economic reasons in the first place, which is a contentious view. But nonetheless, all of that aside, Angel's book did gain a strong audience among the British intellectual elite. Forty reading groups formed at universities around Britain devoted to spreading his message, almost like a religious sect. And they did manage to convince Lord Escher, the chair of the Parliamentary War Committee, who endorsed the book at speeches that he gave at Cambridge and the Sorbonne in Paris, and in which he said that the economic interlacing of nations made war, quote, every day more difficult and improbable. And Escher assured audiences that Germany was just as receptive as Great Britain was to the doctrine of Norman Angel. Now, in this, he was almost certainly wrong. The German government and many other war planners in Britain and all over Europe did not agree with Angel that war was now impossible or too foolish or destructive to be seriously considered. Rather, their conclusion was this, 
that only a long war was economically and politically impossible. It could not be sustained for long before social collapse at home, and hence it only made sense to plan for a short war. Their nation would achieve victory quickly, or else it would be forced to make peace before total social catastrophe. Now today, many people like to cite European statesmen and generals at the outbreak of war in 1914, saying, quote, it will all be over by Christmas, or something like this. And it's easy to see a statement like this as expressing hubris and foolishness that these generals arrogantly assumed that they would just win the war with a few short battles. But in fact, it's clear that they were not so stupid. Rather, they knew that trench stalemate was very likely, and they did not believe that trench stalemate could be sustained for long. Therefore, they thought that if an early decisive victory was not achieved by one side or the other, then all parties would be forced to come to the table and make peace before they were forced to give up by economic and social collapse. So all in all, generals and war planners were not nearly so dumb as they're often made out to be, and they often accepted certain large-scale conclusions put forward by Bloch and Angel, even as they resisted or rejected Bloch's arguments about military tactics and strategy, and they continued to cling to the orthodox Clausewitzian-type ideas of the importance of the attack. So the orthodox ideas about warfare were challenged and they did have to be revised after 1900, but they were never totally abandoned. And there were a number of valid reasons for war planners and commanders to still cling to the traditional war strategies, despite the great changes in weaponry and in social and political conditions. And one can see this in the different ways that one can interpret Clausewitz. As I said last time, Clausewitz's theory is not simplistic. It's very complex and nuanced, and there are different aspects that one could pick out and emphasize in order to adjust to changing conditions. There was his emphasis, for one thing, on the moral factor, which could be seen as just as impactful as weaponry tactics. There was also the factor of chance, which Clausewitz considered to be equally important in the course of war. Chance and fortune could create possibilities and opportunities to overcome tactical disadvantages. And moreover, war planners could create their own theories mixing and matching these different factors, relying on both morale and chance as ways of overcoming the blunt tactical facts of the defender's advantage. There also were a number of actual examples of offensive successes overcoming great tactical odds at different points throughout the 19th century. There was the German victory at Sedan in the Franco-Prussian War. There were several victories by the Boer fighters in southern Africa in a number of engagements in the Boer War, and most especially in the Russo-Japanese War, the last war between two major powers before the outbreak of World War I. And in that war, one could look at the Japanese preemptive attack on Port Arthur and their victory at Mukden. And the Japanese success in that war was especially taken as a model and an inspiration by the British. And the common factor that students and scholars of war found when looking through these different events in the 19th century and on up into the beginning of the 20th century, the common factor was the difference in morale, in the sense of basic fortitude, optimism, and especially the sense of fighting for national honor and dignity, as the Boers were doing on behalf of their small republics in Africa and as the Japanese saw themselves as doing in facing off against a European enemy. And one French officer captured a widespread attitude when he said that war was not the meeting of two physical actions, but rather of two moral actions, and the stronger will would prevail. There also were socio-cultural reasons and biases that you can see to account for why many war planners and commanders continued to cling to the 19th century paradigm of war. There was the widespread mood of romanticism, the rejection of the sort of dry rationalism and mechanization of modern life and modern civilization. And this was seen especially in a sort of nostalgic neo-medievalism, 
nostalgia for an era of honor and heroism, which could be seen, for example, in the work of Tennyson, the defining British poet of the 19th century, who you know, wrote about the Arthurian mythos in his Idylls of the King. And there was from this a celebration of chivalry, which was used as a common set of symbols and stories and values across national lines. For example, as one part of the Anglo-Japanese alliance, which was so critical to Britain in the early 1900s, in 1906, the British crown inducted the Meiji emperor into the Order of the Garter, Britain's oldest and most prestigious chivalric order. And so the imagery of chivalry was used even you know, to, to manage international military politics. And it's no accident that the most celebrated incident in British military history at this moment was the Charge of the Light Brigade, which was a charge by men on horseback, evocative of the Crusades or the Hundred Years' War. And there was a rising obsession with honor among fighters, which was inculcated in the military academies. There was a revival after about 1870, a revival of dueling, which was illegal in Great Britain, but it was quite common in several other countries. In France, it was required that military officers had to accept the challenge of a duel, and if they refused, they could be discharged. And in 1913, when the German government proposed a bill to abolish dueling, the Minister of War objected and said that dueling was an invaluable treasure and part of the German code of honor. And it was seen as analogous. Engaging in a duel was analogous to risking one's life for honor in war. And also after 1900, this code of honor was increasingly applied to nation states. People developed the idea of a national honor. We cannot back down from this alliance. We cannot refuse this challenge. The honor of Russia or the honor of France is at stake. And this whole notion of honor saw war as a kind of gentleman's game. And playing this game well, according to the right rules, was just as important or perhaps even more important than winning. And there was, as you can see here, a class element to this whole mentality, right? The, the gentleman is a man of the leisure class. And the old guard in the military general staffs and the academies were mostly from aristocratic or hereditary military families, such as prominent families of the Junker class in Germany. With the enlargement of the militaries over the course of the 19th century, there was also a new influx of new personnel into these military forces, which tended to be more urban, more middle class, and ignorant of the sort of martial and aristocratic ethos of the traditional landed military class. And they were schooled largely at the newer state military academies, some of them called staff colleges, and many of the traditionalist officers of the Old Guard disapproved of these new staff colleges, which they saw as too technical and lacking in a sense of, of spirit and heroism. And they showed a lot of contempt for these new graduates of the new colleges. And some officers who went to these staff colleges were actually advised to keep it secret that they had gone in order to avoid being you know, ostracized by fellow officers. And part of this feeling of contempt was simply prejudice against the urban middle class, and also particularly for Jews. And as for Jews, they were most fully included in the military system in Austria-Hungary. They were barred from the military in Russia, and in other countries it was more tentative. They were allowed in in very limited and restricted ways, and there was a great deal of fear and suspicion towards Jewish officers. And the you know, disastrous Dreyfus affair, which I talked about in my lecture on France, was partly a reflection of this sort of clash over the acceptance of Jews into the military. Partly this was an expression of a sort of deeper and broader clash in values, where this new middle class was seen as managerial and lacking in passion, courage, patriotism, and the sense of honor. And it seems that the cavalry actually stood out among the branches of the military. It stood out as the most conservative. They were afraid of having their horses taken away from under them and losing this sort of sense of dignity and adventure in battle. And they looked down on the other branches. For example, in Austria-Hungary, cavalrymen called the artillery units, quote, the powder Jews, 
And these contempts and prejudices combined with the common fear of decline, the widespread sense around 1900 that modern man was becoming too weak, lacking in masculinity, that modern fighters therefore would not be willing to sacrifice. And some politicians and war planners even believed that a war, especially an offensive war, would serve to invigorate the nation and to restore a sense of unity and vitality. And all of these factors and feelings played into the formulation of strategy and played into the dilemma of how much to rely upon weaponry, strategic planning, or morale, or some combination of the three. For example, many high-ranking officers simply rejected or resisted the use of new technologies like machine guns, which were perceived to take away the need for fighters to develop skill and courage, and which violated the sense of honor in direct combat. And reportedly, one Italian commander, when an artillery unit delivered to him a set of machine guns, he said to hide them off in the corners of the battlefield so the other side wouldn't see that they were using them. It was shameful. And when lectures were made at war colleges and academies arguing for this huge defender's advantage and the need to totally replace old strategies because of the new weaponry, audiences often objected, and their objections took two basic forms. One, that the moral effect of the attack would still be overwhelming, and secondly, that the quality of the weapons really depended upon the quality of the men behind them. And hence, moral formation, training, discipline, morale were still more important than technology. But resistance to change and to the adoption of new weapons and new strategies didn't just come from the old guard of the officer corps. Resistance also came from the public, which increasingly cultivated a sense of national pride and tradition. For example, after 1900, nations finally began changing their brightly colored uniforms because, of course, with smokeless gunpowder, there was no longer a dense fog of war and so less need to identify friend and foe. And with stronger and more precise rifles, the bright clothes simply made you into an easy target. So the British led the way, changing their uniforms from red to khaki after the Boer War in 1903. And in that war, the British had been easy targets for the Afrikaner farmers to snipe. And the Boers, for their part, mainly wore dusty, drab farmers' clothes and so were more camouflaged. Then in 1910, the Germans followed by changing their uniforms from blue to a dull gray. The French, on their part, traditionally had red trousers and blue jackets. And when the war minister went and viewed battles in the Balkan War in 1912, he then came back to France and advocated that they should change their uniforms from red and blue to a dull brownish color. And this caused outrage in the general staff, which then spilled over into the general public, into the perennially partisan, contentious press in France. And one conservative paper said, quote, to clothe the French soldier in a dull, muddy color would be to realize the wishes of Dreyfusards and Freemasons. And the French National Assembly subsequently held a hearing in which a former war minister said, quote, le pantalon rouge, c'est la France, the red trousers, is France. And the failure of this effort to change French uniforms showed that resistance to reform was often caught up in cultural politics, perhaps most of all in France, but not exclusively so. But nonetheless, there were certain points that the different parties and factions in the war colleges and in the general staffs did have to agree on. And these included the importance of swift action because of the massive advantage that one gained from mobilizing and attacking first. The only clear, indisputable way to neutralize a defender's advantage was to mobilize and reach the field of battle first, hence the obsession with quick mobilization. And they also had to recognize certain overriding conditions of political geography, which delimited what the likely next war would be. So in Europe, there were two main defensive alliances that sort of determined the geography of the European chessboard, you could say. One was the alliance of Germany and Austria-Hungary, which had pledged to join one another in defense against any war with Russia. 
and secondly, the alliance of Russia and France, which would join together in any war against Germany. And furthermore, there were two main centers or spheres of conflict and tension in Europe. One was in the west between France and Germany, where there was a long simmering fear and hostility dating back at least to the Franco-Prussian War and nurtured by a continuing revanchism in France. And secondly, in the east, in the Balkans, where the newly emerged independent states such as Serbia and Bulgaria were hostile to both the Ottoman Empire and to Austria-Hungary and were closely politically aligned with Russia. And you may remember it was Russia that had actually built and sponsored the coalition of Balkan states that then engaged in the First Balkan War against the Ottomans. So these new states could potentially go to war with the Ottoman Empire or the Habsburg Empire or both. And either conflict between the new Balkan states and the Ottomans or between these states and Austria-Hungary could potentially draw in their ally Russia. And in the latter case, if war broke out between Serbia and Austria-Hungary, it could possibly pull in Germany, Russia, and then France. And this possibility was being actively discussed and considered in the general staffs of these various nations. Hence, all major powers must consider and prepare for the possibility of a war, for one thing in Eastern Europe involving Austria-Hungary, Russia, or even Germany and the Ottomans, or secondly in Western Europe, which would involve France and Germany and possibly Great Britain. The link between these two was the Franco-Russian alliance, which gave these two countries some limited sense of security and which furthermore made Germany feel all the more surrounded and threatened. For better or worse, it seems that if a war break out in either theater, the East or the West, there was a real possibility that it would spread into the other and create a Europe-wide war. So several countries had to consider and prepare for the eventuality of a war of this type with the nearest major power or several other major powers. And these plans were weighed and considered in Austria-Hungary, Russia, Germany, France, and Britain. So what did these plans look like and how would they play into the war that did eventually break out? Well, the country that led the way was Germany, perhaps not surprisingly. Their planning was the most meticulous and aggressive. They led the way in opening a new era of detailed war planning and really set the standard. And it was known in much of Europe how exacting and punctilious the German general staff was. And there's actually a joke which says that there are five perfect things in Europe. The Roman Curia, the British Parliament, the French Opera, the Russian Ballet, and the German general staff. And the Germans, like many of their peers, clung to the orthodox view of war and combined it with a new extreme nationalism, exemplified by the general Friedrich von Bernhardi, who in 1911 published a book titled Deutschland und der nächste Krieg, or Germany and the Next War. And this book argued that war was a divine business and the route through which Germany would realize its destiny. It called upon social Darwinism and cast war as a biological necessity. So there's the religious overtone and this sort of pseudoscience. So war was a biological necessity, a process by which the naturally strong would outcompete the weak. And hence, Germany should ignore treaties and claim and seize the power that they were entitled to by force. And the Germans also took the sort of Clausewitzian traditional view of war and chose to emphasize the aspect of discipline, planning, and precision. And Germany was, you could say, obsessed with formulating precise timetables for mobilization, movement of troops, and engagements. And hence, in this way, German strategy, you could say, combined what Clausewitz would call hatred and reason, or the emotional and rational aspects of war making. And the general staff was led by a succession of influential chiefs of staff. Firstly, Helmut von Moltke the Elder, who led the Prussian general staff and then the German general staff from the time of unification until 1888. And he was more or less a classic Bismarckian, shrewd, often cautious, who formulated careful plans to contain wars and who oversaw Prussia's victories over Denmark and Austria and France. 
And Moltke saw Russia as a bigger threat than France. Russia was by far the largest state in Europe and could muster a mind-bogglingly large army. And he believed that Germany ought to concentrate on defending its eastern flank against the enormous Russian threat. Moreover, by the end of his life, he saw war as increasingly dangerous. And before dying, he gave a final warning, which I quoted in my last lecture, against war, which now would only be a people's war and would be sort of unthinkably destructive and uncontainable. But shortly before he died, he retired and he came to be replaced in a few years by General Alfred von Schlieffen, who took up the post of chief of the general staff in 1891. And Schlieffen believed that war would eventually be necessary and unavoidable. And after 1892, France and Russia entered into a defensive alliance directed against Germany. And hence, this meant that a German war with one of these neighboring rival powers would almost certainly mean a war with both. And they would have to face a possible combined French-Russian pincer attack, leading to a two-front war. So this was obviously very threatening to Schlieffen and his colleagues. And their basic idea was that it was unwise to try to fight on two fronts at once. And so they looked at the differences between their two rivals. France was much closer, and it was faster moving and better armed. Although it was not as large a country as Germany or Russia, it was at the cutting edge of technology and weaponry. Russia, on the other hand, was much larger, but it was more distant and sprawling. As of the 1890s, it seemed that France would be able to mobilize its troops in only two weeks, and be ready to attack Germany directly, whereas Russia would take six weeks and perhaps even longer to reach any strategic points in Germany. And this hence left at least a four-week window in which Germany would have to deal with France alone and not yet Russia. And so they decided to take advantage of this window in order to deal with France and in order to pursue a strategy of entrapment and envelopment. And Alfred von Schlieffen, it seems, took as his model the Battle of Cannae in the Second Punic War in southern Italy, in which the Carthaginian general Hannibal and his army had surrounded and annihilated a much larger Roman army. So Schlieffen believed that a strategy like this could be executed in Europe against the French. And so Schlieffen began to formulate a plan according to which the Germans ought to confront France first, move quickly and decisively to invade France and occupy Paris, and then pivot the bulk of the army eastward to deal with Russia. A problem with this was that the French border was highly fortified, and it would be very costly or even impossible to break through. So in 1899, Schlieffen first proposed a plan to move through Belgium. So Belgium, as we discussed earlier, is a small state by comparison. And in 1899, it had a very small military and not a great deal of fortification on its borders. But it did have a lot of industry and wealth. It was one of the premier industrial countries in the world. It also contained some flat terrain with good, easily passable roads, especially in the western end of the country in Flanders, which appeared to be possibly the easiest pathway to cross into France. So Schlieffen's logic was that if war was declared, either Germany or France was bound to invade Belgium and get the advantage of faster, easier movement, with fewer obstacles, and control over rails, industries, etc. So in Schlieffen's view, since it was inevitable that someone was going to go through Belgium, Germany ought to do it first. And the German general staff insisted that this was a military necessity, and the Kaiser and the Chancellor very reluctantly accepted this reasoning and signed off and gave permission to make a plan involving the invasion of Belgium. Now, the violation of Belgian neutrality, they knew, would very likely bring in Great Britain into the war. Britain was the main ally of Belgium and was the traditional guarantor of Belgium's neutrality. But their power was mainly at sea, not on land. They only had a small expeditionary force of fewer than 100,000 men, 
And one Prussian general remarked that the Prussian police should be enough to arrest the entire British expeditionary force. And moreover, the British would somehow have to ferry over this force across the English Channel and land it in Europe, which would be even more difficult. So the Germans felt that it would not make a big difference, even if Britain did declare war on them in retaliation for violating Belgian territory. And they felt that if their plan worked, then the campaign in the West would likely already be won and the French would be defeated before the British even became a factor. Now, after supposedly defeating and occupying France, they would then move east and attack Russia. So this plan was already sketched out in 1899. It was then further developed in greater detail in 1905. And they determined the initial disposition of forces that would be necessary on the Western Front. They would put only minimal forces in East Prussia to hold off the Russians for the time being in the East, while meanwhile they would muster up most active and reserve forces, totaling about one and a half million men into an enormous army in the West. And they would form them into a long line running from Switzerland on the left, which was a neutral country and mountainous, all the way to the North Sea on the right. And in this line, they would put relatively light forces on the left wing on the German-French border in Alsace-Lorraine. Meanwhile, they would put fairly light forces in the center around Luxembourg, and they would concentrate the great bulk of their forces on the right wing along the border with Belgium. And the idea was that the lighter forces on the French border would actually tempt the French to attack there which the French likely would do anyway because they wanted to recapture Alsace-Lorraine. That was their great national mission. And moreover, the Germans might even retreat back a bit towards the Rhine as a feint to further draw in the French and lure them into a sack, as they said. Meanwhile, Germany would demand passage through Belgium. And the Belgians most likely, as the Germans thought, would give in or would offer only nominal resistance, because at this time, even in 1905, Belgium still had a very small military and would really stand no chance of stopping a German invasion. If they refused, the Germans would attack, occupy Brussels and Antwerp and other major cities, and demand an indemnity from the Belgian government. But either way, whether the Belgians gave in or tried to resist, either way, major forces of the German army would march through Belgium make their way by various means to Flanders in the west, then regroup into formation, turn left and march quickly southward into France, leaving no territory along the North Sea untouched. And one commander was quoted as saying, quote, let the last man on the right brush the channel with his sleeve. And the advantage of this in part was that if any British forces had managed to land, along the North Sea or the Channel, they would then be confronted and swept up in this massive German invasion. Then they would circle all the way back and attack the French in Alsace-Lorraine from the rear, thus encircling and entrapping the French army, crushing them, and finally capturing the country. Now, the main problem with this plan, it seemed, was that it involved too many men. Germany just didn't have enough active forces to do all of these things at once, to defend and hold off the French on the left wing and confront the Belgians and invade France on the right wing. So the solution to this, in Schlieffen's view, was to use reserves, including in the right wing, right at the front, at, in the sort of heat of the battle. And this was controversial. Most reserve units comprised men over age 26, and in the views of many commanders and planners, they were not young or energetic enough. But Schlieffen's view was that they were more experienced and could be relied upon to lead the way in this massive campaign. So overall, Schlieffen's plan, or the Schlieffen plan as we now call it, seems to embody the ideas of boldness, confidence, and risk-taking, but they reassured themselves that it was backed up by extremely detailed and calculated planning. Each division's movements through Belgium and France was timed out day by day, and the plan ended with taking Paris on day 39. Now Schlieffen retired the following year in 1906, and he was replaced by Helmut von Moltke the Younger, who was the nephew 
of the original General Moltke. He, like his uncle, he was more cautious, and he was concerned with the dangers and possible unexpected problems in this plan, and he saw too much risk of the French possibly breaking through in Alsace-Lorraine and threatening Germany. So he made adjustments, including by slightly strengthening the forces in the left wing and the center, which necessitated drawing some men away from the right wing. And this, too, caused some consternation. There were many people in Schlieffen's school of thought who thought that Moltke the Younger was ruining the plan. And Schlieffen himself openly opposed it, saying that the right wing must deal the decisive blow to the French. And reportedly in 1913, when he was on his deathbed, his last words were, quote, only keep the right wing strong. So the ultimate result of this internal controversy was a sort of compromise where 300,000 men would be deployed on the left wing in Alsace-Lorraine, 400,000 in the center at Luxembourg, and 700,000 into Belgium. And this was, you could see, as a kind of combination of extreme risk-taking with extreme planning. So the implication of all this was that any small disruption could potentially ruin the entire plan and hence destroy the whole campaign and even lose the war. There was no room for error or even, as Clausewitz might say, for the role of chance. And more specifically, with hindsight, we could say that this whole plan rested on a lot of wishful thinking about Belgium. Schlieffen and his allies assumed little resistance, and they did not take account of Belgium's sense of honor and also did not take account of Belgium's increasing campaign of militarization. In the last few years before 1914, they had built a new network of forts, including new modern concrete fortresses surrounding major cities like Liège, and they had undergone a buildup of their army and instituted universal conscription in 1913, so that by 1914, Belgium now had six divisions comprising about 186,000 soldiers, as well as 69,000 troops manning the fortresses. Now, this was, of course, small compared to Germany's 50 divisions, but it was also not nothing. And the general staff under Moltke the Younger evidently ignored this when they drew some troops away from the right wing. And the more cautious camp, for their part, wanted to draw some forces back to the left wing to have some insurance against a possible French attack. While meanwhile, on the other hand, the more aggressive camp wanted to maintain faith that an aggressive attack through Belgium was the way to a fast victory. Neither side really wanted to take account of this rising Belgian strength, and so it was never incorporated into war planning. Now, at different points through this process of formulating the Schlieffen Plan, Germany's ideas and intentions leaked over through rumors and sometimes stolen documents over to France. So what did the French do? What was their approach? Well, if we remember the Clausewitz model, he argues that war involves factors of three different forces, hatred, reason, and chance. And like the Germans, the French also believed in the power of national feeling and passion what in Clausewitz, what Clausewitz termed the hatred factor. French leaders, both left and right, called upon the spirit of Valmy, recalling that remarkable battle in 1792 when the less equipped infantry of the French Republic overcame the Prussians while chanting Vive la Nation and singing the Marseillaise. So passion for revolution and the homeland, the patrie, had overcome greater power as measured in numbers or weaponry. And whereas the Germans, on their part, were influenced by social Darwinism and Nietzsche, the French were immersed in the ideas of Henri Bergson, whose philosophy of life was driven by élan vital, or the vital force. And French strategy was taught and elaborated mainly in the École Supérieure de la Guerre, the main leading light of which was the general Ferdinand Foch who started off as a professor, and then the Prime Minister Clemenceau appointed him as director of the school in 1906. And Foch was also a disciple of Clausewitz, and he believed in the overriding importance of the moral factor. And he was quoted as saying, La victoire, c'est la volonté. Victory is will. But at the same time, he also understood Clausewitz and his doctrines differently from the Germans. So instead of emphasizing reason and planning, as the Germans tended to do, 
Foch emphasized the element of fortune. He recognized the need for contingency plans and surete, or insurance, in the case of unforeseen events and opportunities. He rejected rigid plans and especially timetables, and he argued for the vital importance of flexibility and spontaneity in response to events. And this became especially important, really, for the whole French command structure, as Germany really grew much larger <laughs> than France, both in population and industrial power. And hence, the French felt a great need to find and exploit unexpected failures or weaknesses in enemy strategies. Therefore, the German approach, you could say in some, was based on the combination of hatred and reason, or the emotional and the rational, whereas the French approach was based on hatred and chance, or the emotional and the opportunistic. So under the influence of Foch and his allies, French planning changed dramatically. From the 1890s, war plans had been defensive-offensive, which involved concentrating forces near the German border, making use of fortresses and terrain, which made it very difficult for Germans to surround or envelop them there, but also to wait for a German attack, and hold it off until the Russian allies could mobilize and join the war from the east, and then once the Russians were engaged, counterattack. So that was the basic paradigm from the 1890s up until about 1904. And in that year, a spy from Germany sold the French a series of documents showing that the Germans intended to attack through Belgium and Luxembourg. So the defensive French positions were spread somewhat further north, but then there was fear that they might be spread too thin and hence not be able to regroup and counterattack. So what to do? This led to a debate between different positions, one arguing for a more defensive stance, which would focus on defending on the Belgian border, or to take a more offensive stance and attack first before the Germans could even get through Belgium. So Foch and his disciples favored the offensive side, and his ideas were pushed even further to their extreme by a strategist named Colonel Grandmaison, whom Clemenceau also promoted and elevated, and who gave two lectures at the École Supérieure de la Guerre in 1911, and which had a galvanizing effect. And his basic idea was offensive à l'outrance, or offensive to the limit. And he insisted that France could win if it became once again an idea with a sword, as it had been in the revolution. And this approach was quickly adopted by the leadership, including the president of the Republic, Fallière, and then by the general staff. And the general staff was reorganized in, along new lines. The vice president, General Michel, for his part, opposed this lurch towards offensive planning, and he still advocated for a defensive strategy because he had foreseen that the Germans would attack through Belgium and he wanted to call up reserves and deploy them in a long line all along the Belgian border and, if possible, invade and take Antwerp if and when the Germans crossed into Belgium. But the rest of the general staff was outraged by what they saw as basically heresy and also the use of reserves, which they saw as inferior, having no trained officers, and comprising mature men with families who would not have enough élan or reckless will to attack the enemy. So Michel was sacked and the whole general staff was reshuffled. A new chief was appointed, a young general named Joseph Joffre, who had never, for his part, commanded an army, but who became sort of the flag bearer of this new philosophy. And the general staff put these new offensive ideas into their field manual issued in 1913. And this field manual gave little mention of weaponry, but it put great emphasis on what it called cran, meaning nerve or guts. And it said that the French army, quote, returning to its traditions, no longer knows any law but the offensive. This was then the guiding spirit of the new war plan called Plan 17, which was worked out between 1911 and 1913 to prepare for the possibility of war with Germany. So in the view of the general staff in these years when they were formulating Plan 17, they recognized that Germans would throw a lot of their troops into their right wing and would likely invade through Belgium. And they adjudged that this would give them some time. The march through Belgium would be slow. And the French commanders didn't believe that the Germans would throw in all of their reservists, 
In their view, reservists were too old, encumbered by home concerns and responsibilities past their prime. And so, of course, they would be kept back for defense within Germany. So therefore, the French believed that the right wing of the German invasion would be thin and overstretched. And hence, the French would be able to hold off the right wing with minimal defensive lines. Or even if the German right wing was very strong, then the center and left would be weak. And this would allow the French to strike hard at weak points in the German lines and break through, leaving Germany exposed and theirs for the taking. So General Joffre made a concentration plan, betting that the French forces could make a fast attack at selected points along the German-French border, breaking through before the Germans could make it through Belgium. So the result was what we call Plan 17, and it was finalized in April 1913 and kept secret within the War Council, but copies were finally given out to army commanders in February 1914. And as we said, this was only a concentration plan. It included no detailed campaign plan. The exact strategy would be left to contingency in the moment. Most forces would gather into two main armies, both along the northeastern border near Metz in Alsace-Lorraine. One would be poised to attack just south of Metz and the other to the north. And smaller forces, meanwhile, would be deployed farther north near Luxembourg in order to forestall and hold off German attack through Belgium and Luxembourg. Only territorial reserve units would be deployed further northwest along the Belgian border, stretching out to the North Sea. So hence, because of this disposition of forces, the campaign, once started, had to be offensive. They could not sit and wait for the Germans to arrive by their preferred route through Belgium. They had to strike first and take advantage of initiative and surprise. The two armies on either side of Metz would move aggressively, look for German weak points, press through, cross the Rhine at Mainz, cut off the large German right wing from their supply lines in Germany, and then head east, presumably, for Berlin. And that was it. <laughs> Beyond that, the details would have to be improvised. So in a looser sort of way, the French Plan 17 also had no room for error. They could not be delayed. They could not wait for German action. And they had to move fast, strike the first blow, and achieve the advantage in the first engagements. So now, as we said, both the French and the Germans now fully expected that the war would start with an invasion of Belgium. And this would almost certainly draw the attention and the ire of the British. So the British, for their part, followed along somewhat late to this planning game. They only began considering the idea of getting into a war on the continent in 1905. So in that year, Russia had just lost the Russo-Japanese War and was reeling. And this left France in the West exposed without an effective ally backing them up in the East. So the French were afraid that the Germans might take advantage of this moment. And in fact, Germany did start aggressively pushing the issue of Morocco. And as you might remember, the Kaiser himself rode into Tangier on horseback. So there was fear in France and to some degree in Britain that if this tension escalated into war, the Germans would seize the moment to attack France. And the French knew that they might then have to attack back through Belgium. So they reached out to the British Foreign Secretary, Edward Grey, in order to figure out what to do in the case of this possible German threat. So in 1905 to 1906, as different prime ministers shuffled in and out of office in Westminster, the Foreign Secretary Gray worked out a series of unofficial arrangements with the French, which said that if Belgium was invaded, Britain would honor its treaty obligations and defend Belgium's neutrality. So therefore, if the Germans invaded through Belgium first, before the French did, then Britain would send four divisions of their expeditionary force across the Channel, which they believed they could achieve in two months. Once they were there, the French would have command over all land troops, while meanwhile the British would have command at sea. But all of this negotiation was done unofficially behind, behind closed doors, which allowed the British a lot of wiggle room to back out. There was no formal treaty hammering this down. 
and they started picking out possible sites and plans for landing British forces in Belgium. But the British general staff nixed this agreement to defer to French command on land. The general staff wanted to maintain their power to act independently. So this was more or less the ambiguous point where things stood after the fear of Germany calmed down and receded after 1906, and as these disputes like the Moroccan crisis were worked out. So some in Great Britain wanted to change this whole strategy, to throw out these unofficial agreements with France, and to focus only on naval war. And even if they did at some point go to war with Germany, they wanted to exploit their naval advantage to possibly even try to go around Denmark into the Baltic and land British troops directly in East Prussia. But none of these ideas were ever developed or worked out in detail. And in 1907 to 1908, the Brits even began to pull away from their commitments to support France in the case of a war. In 1909, the head of the British War College, General Henry Wilson, took the cause up again. He saw eventual war with Germany as likely, and he reached out to his sort of opposite number, Ferdinand Foch, the head of the War College in France, and the two became friends. In 1910, Wilson reportedly asked Foch, what is the smallest number of British soldiers that would be of any use to you? And Foch immediately replied, just one, and we will see to it that he is killed. So this is a little ambiguous, but presumably Foch meant that even one British soldier dying in this war would get the British nation rallied fully behind the war effort. The next year, 1911, the second Moroccan crisis broke out, again causing tension and feuding between France and Germany. And this made the liberal government under H.H. H. Asquith again pay attention to the possibility of war with Germany. And General Wilson persuaded them to recommit to the French alliance and restart joint planning. Wilson made private arrangements with France, according to which the British expeditionary force would be prepped to mobilize on short notice and it would include a total of 150,000 men and 60,000 horses. The British would transport and land these men in sites in northern France and place them under French command. But once again, the cabinet had never signed on to this agreement, and many others rejected this whole idea and still wanted to focus only on naval operations and to try to land directly in Belgium or Germany. So in August 1911, Asquith held an emergency cabinet meeting to debate this question. The Navy secretary argued the Navy's position, which wanted to land troops in Prussia. Meanwhile, Winston Churchill, the Home Secretary, called upon himself to argue for the Army's position, arguing that the main German force would surely go through Belgium, and if they landed them in France or Belgium fast enough, they could stop the German right wing from being able to invade France. And Churchill won this argument, Asquith agreed to the Army's plan, and then appointed Churchill as Lord of the Admiralty. Meanwhile, the anti-war and pacifist wings of the Liberal Party, which had basically been shut out of this secret cabinet meeting, were furious. They saw this as a backdoor commitment to war, which not only the public and the parliament had never agreed to, but not even the entire cabinet. At the same time, in 1912, the German government proposed new, a new naval law to again increase the size of their fleet. British diplomats tried to convince them to drop this plan, and the Germans asked in exchange for the British to be neutral in case of any war between Germany and France, and the British refused. Instead, they made a further naval pact with France, according to which Britain would commit to protect the North Sea and the Channel, while the French would concentrate their naval power in the Mediterranean. So this informal alliance and arrangement between Britain and France was now being put into concrete action, at least at sea. But at the insistence of the anti-war wing within the British government and parliament, Prime Minister Asquith did send dispatches to the French saying that they were not committed to war and that both countries could decide in the event how to support the other and whether or not to assist by armed force. So this was taken as satisfactory enough for the different factions within Britain, and General Wilson 
then proceeded to make friends with the new French chief of staff, General Joffre, and he attended joint maneuvers in France with General Joffre and Grand Duke Nicholas of Russia, the commander-in-chief of the Russian forces. Meanwhile, while all of this was going on, no one had talked to the Belgians. The British attaché asked the Belgian government if they could work out plans to land British troops if the Germans invaded, and the Belgians responded by saying, you will have to wait to talk about that until your assistance is requested. And then further, when the British foreign secretary asked the Belgians directly, he was told, if any Britons land in Belgium without being explicitly invited, they will be fired upon. So in 1912-14, to 14, the French worked out more details of their joint plan of how to move land, house, and supply British forces, which they called Plan W, after Henry Wilson. And by this point, by 1914, the alliance was fairly close, at the same time that it was strangely informal and ambiguous, a sort of overly detailed gentleman's agreement. And this plan, moreover, really only contemplated a short war. It would involve moving six divisions quickly across the channel to support the French, but it made no considerations for long-term recruitment and supply of this British force, no plan for invading and defeating Germany, much less other possible opponents, and it had no naval strategy. Why was this? Why was it so detailed in its sort of first stages and then really non-existent after that? It was because the French and most of all the British were assuming a short war. They were influenced by the thinking of Bloch and Angel and their arguments about the impossibility of a long-term great power war. They just thought that they could turn these facts to their advantage. So namely, Britain at this point was still the premier commercial and financial power in the world. They saw that the economies of all the great states were interconnected, and Britain was the premier world center of trade and finance. And they believed that they still effectively controlled the levers of international credit and investment, just as their navy still controlled the sea lanes of global trade. So the Naval Intelligence Department, beginning in 1906, persuaded the cabinet to develop a plan in case of a war with Germany. It would involve shutting off credit, calling in their debts, and cutting off trade to the German ports. And they would furthermore sanction other nations that continued to trade with or invest in Germany, thus effectively besieging the country and hastening the economic collapse. Now, they knew that this would very likely also lead to a global economic catastrophe because, as their economists had pointed out, there's a domino effect. If an economy as large as Germany implodes, it's going to pull everyone else down with them. But nonetheless, the cabinet believed that Britain would suffer less since they would still have strong domestic industries and access to their colonies. For almost 100 years, from the First World War up to the 21st century, this whole aspect of the British war plan was basically ignored and forgotten, although it was considered hugely important at the time. Why is that? One reason is because it could be seen as rather sneaky and dishonorable, a kind of backdoor way of undermining your enemy rather than facing them in the field. This was, you know, economic warfare was a very new idea. Another reason is because it didn't work. When this plan was put into effect in its initial stages in 1914, it caused enormous collateral damage and blowback on the British economy and to friendly neutral countries such as the United States, who lobbied to take down these trade restrictions. And so the British were forced to make a U-turn and fall back on just the traditional tactic of the blockade of the German coast. And so after the war, this whole economic warfare plan became a sort of embarrassment, a kind of skeleton in the closet, particularly considering how much confidence the government had invested in this plan that just didn't work. And the records of this whole aspect of British strategy were largely buried or censored, and they were not really part of the historical narrative until 2012, when the historian Nicholas Lambert published the book Planning Armageddon, which sort of excavated and reconstructed this economic warfare plan that never was really realized. And I'll put a link in the description to a lecture by Lambert where he discusses this early form of economic warfare. So now, meanwhile, as you know, this war didn't begin 
in the West. It didn't begin with a clash between Germany and France. It began in the East. Because the feud between Serbia and Austria-Hungary mushroomed and pulled in Russia. So Russia, as we've said before, as of 1900 or so, was a kind of slow-moving giant. It was less industrialized, it was somewhat technologically backwards compared to the other great powers, but nonetheless it was by far the largest state in Europe, with an empire of 161 million people as of 1910, more than twice the size of the next runner-up, which was Germany, with only 65 million. So Russia, regardless of being seen as somewhat backwards, nonetheless it inspired tremendous dread and awe, especially on the part of Germany which was sort of haunted by visions of a vast Russian army steamrolling into Prussia. It was also a source, correspondingly, of reassurance to their allies in the West, especially France. And Russian war planning for the possibility of a war with Germany began in the 1870s, and it was then revised in the 1880s to take account of the German-Austrian alliance, concluded in 1879, and hence had to take into account the real possibility of a two-pronged war, against both of the great Central European powers. Their plans were then further elaborated in 1900 in order to factor in Russia's alliance with France. So the Russians had to consider two scenarios. One, the possibility that Germany mobilizes and attacks Russia right away. And secondly, the possibility that Germany focuses on France first and only turns to Russia later after having come to some conclusion with France. So this 1900 plan was necessarily broad and vague. It involved forming two armies, a northern and southern army, to face off against Germany and Austria-Hungary, respectively. It then wasn't really developed further until 1905, after the defeat of Russia by Japan, which was humiliating and devastating and led to a campaign of Russian reforms over the next seven years. And this wave of reform involved the creation of a state defense council, which was headed by the Grand Duke Nikolai, a relative of the Tsar. The shortening of the term of active military service for conscripts, which might seem counterproductive, but it actually allowed for more rapid recruitment and training of new conscripts and the amassing of a large reserve army, as had already been done in Germany. It involved the improvement of fortifications, especially along the western frontier, and the rapid building of new railroads for faster mobilization and movement of troops, such that the time needed to mobilize the full Russian forces was gradually reduced from six weeks to only two weeks in 1913. But still, nonetheless, it was almost impossible for Russia to plan precisely for war contingencies because their empire was so huge and it had so many rivals and potential enemies on all its borders in all directions, as of 1900, the Russians had to consider the possibility of going to war against Sweden, Germany, Austria-Hungary, Romania, the Ottoman Empire, China, and Japan. So firstly, through assiduous diplomacy, Russia had to come to accommodations with most of these states and gradually was able to focus in more closely after 1910 on just the Germany and Austria-Hungary scenario. But even still, there was still a serious threat of the Ottomans joining in and going to war against them on the Black Sea or in the Caucasus. So in 1910, the Russians began to settle on a concentration plan called Plan 18, which would gather the main body of forces first within the interior of Russia, and hence would, they would be prepared to respond to German, Austrian, or Ottoman attack. And they would be ready also to retreat deeper into Russia to stretch the German supply lines and starve them out, as they had done to the French in 1812. But this defensive plan was controversial and debated, much as defensive plans had been debated and rejected in France and other countries. So many Russian planners wanted to gather forces on the western border and take an aggressive posture in order to take advantage of any enemy weaknesses. And some argued that they should be concentrated along the southwest to be ready to attack Austria-Hungary and capture Budapest and then Vienna, whereas others argued that they should be on the northwest ready to attack East Prussia and strike for Berlin. 
and this would then take advantage of the likelihood that the Germans would probably spend the first month of a war fighting with France and trying to take Paris. So this would give them an opportunity to then attack Germany's weak eastern flank. Now, the dispute between these two views ended up leading to a compromise plan, which held that two main armies would amass on the western border, one to attack Austria-Hungary and the other Germany. And they furthermore distinguished two possible scenarios. One, if Germany initially spent most of its armies westward against France, then Germany would put most of its forces against Austria-Hungary and only leave a small, fast attack force against Germany. Whereas on the other hand, if Germany concentrated on the east, then Russia would send most of its forces to the northwest to counter the Germans and only a small force to hold off Austria-Hungary and protect the main Russian army from being attacked in the rear. Meanwhile, they made no serious plan to send their full force to try and take Berlin, which is what the French really wanted them to do. But that was sort of lost in the shuffle. And furthermore, all of these scenarios depended on the Ottomans and Sweden remaining neutral, which was not a sure thing. Now, as for naval power, Russia was a serious naval power. It had large fleets based at Sebastopol on the Black Sea and Helsinki on the Baltic. But like the British, the Russians never made any specific plans of what to do with these fleets, other than presumably blocking German shipping on the Baltic. Now finally, in 1912-13, to 13, a Russian military commission made plans for a possible pre-mobilization preparatory period. So this commission argued that war could potentially start in any of four different places around Russia's borders. In Europe, against Germany and Austria-Hungary, in the Caucasus, in Central Asia, or in the Far East. And they pointed out that, quote, the commencement of military action is always preceded by a more or less prolonged period of diplomatic tension known as the period preparatory to war. And hence, they concluded that if there was a crisis and war seemed likely, then even before mobilization was ordered, they should start making quiet preparations. And this decision by Russia, one can see, is maybe their one prescient move, right? That they've, they foresaw this sort of escalating diplomatic standoff. And they perceived that by this time, by 1912-13, mobilization of military forces was a Herculean task and enormously costly, especially for Russia, for other nations as well, but most of all for this kind of lumbering giant that was Russia. And hence, it would be a disastrous waste for Russia to start mobilization and then cancel it. And hence, in effect, mobilization became the real declaration of war. And this would turn out to be very important in the July crisis and the outbreak of war, that mobilization signified a firm decision to go to war, even more so than the sort of formality of a declaration. So this was basically Russia's stance, right? Tremendous uncertainty, sort of confused, divided plans, but a consciousness that they had to take diplomatic events carefully into account and start preparing for the eventuality of war far ahead. So who does that leave, of course? Well, that leaves the country that actually did start this war, which is Austria-Hungary. And Austria-Hungary, even more than other European nations, gave a great deal of independence to its military. The chief of the general staff reported directly to the emperor, and the emperor himself had more limited powers than, say, the Russian Tsar. And so the, the military really had tremendous freedom of movement, and it really didn't consult at all with the parliament or the other ministries. For many years, the emperor Franz Josef had in place his friend and contemporary Friedrich von Beck Rosikowski in place as chief of the general staff. And he was a sort of old-fashioned general with a similar mentality to Franz Josef. But in 1906, the emperor was persuaded to finally replace him with the somewhat younger Franz Konrad von Hutzendorf, who was an advocate of a more aggressive policy, right? was a product very much of this turn-of-the-century generation, and who advocated for preemptive war with either Italy or Serbia. Hutzendorf was sacked in 1911 for overstepping his authority, but the following year, in 1912, he was reinstated as the Balkan Wars began and presented new threats 
Now, Austria-Hungary was in an extremely difficult position. It had less money and less industry than the other major powers. It was fully surrounded by possible enemies, even more so than Russia, which at least had nobody on its northern flank in the Arctic. And it was a fragmented realm, as we've seen with multiple regional and linguistic groups, many of whom were of dubious loyalty to the empire. In military terms, Austria-Hungary had much fewer reserves than Russia or Germany. It had less modern weaponry, especially field artillery, and it had rugged terrain and less extensive infrastructure, making it very hard to extend their supply lines. And there was a great danger of armies being cut off if they ventured too far out of the core of the empire. So this made war mobilization extremely difficult to plan. And there was huge pressure on Austro-Hungarian officers to come up with solutions and to make up for these material deficits with ingenious, clever plans. The officers were largely educated at the Kriegsschule, the School of War, which was an extremely competitive academy designed to weed out students and select only the most brilliant for leadership. And this sort of intense competition within the academy led to a scandal in 1910, the so-called Hofrichter Affair, in which one officer was caught poisoning his classmates. So meanwhile, Konrad von Hutzendorf instilled in officers a belief in the importance of taking the initiative and staying on the offensive. He studied battles in the Boer War and the Russo-Japanese War, and he recognized the obstacles presented by modern firepower, but he still saw instances in which high morale and aggressive tactics, such as outflanking and pincer movements, had overcome the defensive advantage. And he saw the main threats as Serbia, Russia, and Italy, despite Italy technically being an ally, one of the so-called triple alliance, which only goes to show you how you know, loose and fragile these alliances really were. And after 1910, the war staff under Hutzendorf made out different mobilization plans for different possible scenarios called I, R, B, and R and B, which designate war with Italy, with Russia, with Serbia, or with Russia and Serbia. And the basic deployments for these different plans were remarkably similar, almost the same. They involved forces being assembled into three main groups. Firstly, a minimal Balkan group, which would be deployed in Bosnia and Croatia in order to defend against attack from Serbia or Italy, and also in order to prevent and suppress resistance and keep Habsburg control over these possibly restive Balkan lands. Then there would be a larger group A, which would be assembled as a swing force to attack either Russia or Italy. And finally, a somewhat smaller group B, which would be assembled to attack Russia or Serbia if needed. Once mobilization had been achieved, then the general staff would follow different war campaign plans depending on who the enemies were. So in case I against Italy, they would invade south into the Veneto. In case B against Serbia, they would not attack Belgrade, which was well defended, but instead they would attack the northwestern mountainous part of Serbia, which was difficult to attack in large sweeping operations, but it would preemptively prevent Serbia from being able to attack across the northern frontier into Bosnia. So once again, the need to keep control of Bosnia was a high priority. Then in case R of war against Russia, as this plan was developed in the 1880s, consulting with Germany, Austria-Hungary would move troops into Galicia, the sort of southern border province of Poland, and they would coordinate with the Germans in a pincer attack to surround the Russian forces. After 1906, as Austria-Hungary learned about the Schlieffen Plan, they then revised their own plans to use fast-moving attack forces to quickly engage and pin down the Russians and then wait for the Germans to deal with France and then pivot to the east. Now, possibly, according to some sources, the Germans may have also promised the Austro-Hungarians that they would use some of their contingent in East Prussia to attack southward into Russian Poland and so help the Austrians to distract the Russians. But this is uncertain and was disputed after the war. Very likely there was miscommunication and misunderstanding here. In 1913, it became clear that Austria's R plan was very dubious. So Austria-Hungary had once had a far superior rail system to Russia and could expect faster mobilization and deployment than the Russians. 
But by 1913, rail building in Russia had really caught up and closed that gap. So the advantages of speed were now negated. And also, there was a lack of good intelligence about Russian plans and abilities, because, as they discovered, the traitor Alfred Radl had been giving away all of Austria's spies in Russia for several years, and thus cutting off their network of intelligence. So, by this point, Conrad basically redoubled, as so many other war planners did, emphasizing the need for high morale and the seizing of the initiative. But now even morale was doubtful, and the Radl affair had even undermined that, as it planted doubts about Austro-Hungarian unity and about the honor and loyalty of Austria's officer corps. So all of this might underscore the great irony, then, that of all these powers, it was Austria-Hungary that first actually went on the offensive and was the first to declare war in a sort of rolling disaster that would pull all of these countries and others ultimately into a global war. But next, and as one of the final lectures, I hope I will discuss diplomacy in the early years of the 20th century and how the conventions and procedures of diplomacy in that age ended up failing in the July crisis in 1914, leading the way to the Great War. But lastly, I would like to thank my patrons, most particularly those whose names begin with the letter S. So thank you to Sam, Another Sam, Sam Bag, Sam Mess, Sari Nichols, Scott Daniel Weiss, Scott Smith, Sean Greening, Shana Maidala, Sierra H, Siyuan Soon, Slate Mills, Sparky Abraham, Spencer, SRD, Steya Hofhaus, Stepan Jezek, Steve Hamlet, Stephen Guggen, Summer Crossan, Susan, Susan Lewis, Susan Marsh, Susie Jones, and Suzanne Lee. Thank you.